This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. F for global law, and um, it's in the notes, the course notes, uh, chapter four, the International Court of Arbitration. In olden days, that is before the current format, the F four with the multiple choice questions and just two hours. Uh, previously, the format was a three-hour exam with ten questions worth ten marks each, you know, ten essay questions. And in global law, I think I'm right, I'm pretty sure I'm right, there was not a single exam for the previous 12, 14 maybe, uh, before the change, where there was not at least one, and there were sometimes two questions on the subject of arbitration. So your examiner then, and it's still the same examiner now, was obviously a keen fan of the concept of the International Court of Arbitration, and there's no reason to suggest that arbitration will not be asked in future exams. So we need to cover arbitration. It starts, as I say, it starts on page 19 of the current notes, um, but of course that may change as notes get updated and changed and, and um, added to and de de deleted from. So here we are. The International Court of Arbitration was established um, by the International Chamber of Commerce uh, nearly 100 years ago. You see, I'm going to have to change that note, aren't I? When it becomes over 100 years, I'm going to have to change the note. But I accept it. It was nearly 100 years ago. Promotes the use of arbitration procedures and promotional decisions. It's not actually a court. It says it's the International Court of Arbitration. It isn't a court, not in the traditional conventional sense of a court with judges and uh, legal representatives and you present your case and there's discovery proceedings and, and they, the counsel for the defence and the counsel for the prosecution. It's not a court. It's um, uh, no formal judgment is given. It's not, uh, no sentence is given, no fines are handed out. So... It's merely a referee, if you would like. It provides the referee to help in the resolution of disputes, and particularly international trade disputes. So they exercise judicial supervision uh, and over arbitration proceedings. They promote the arbitration procedure in commercial disputes, as it says in the notes here, and they oversee all elements, they maintain a list. The prospective arbitrators, people that are prepared to put themselves forward in case of need uh, to act as a referee, to act as a, an arbitrator, a conciliator. And the International Court confirms the appointment of arbitrators. It doesn't simply confirm them, it does other things as well. It confirms them, it appoints them, it replaces them. And this arbitration proceeding is, um, I mentioned the word referee, but it also mediates and they conciliate and they uh, assist in this conflict resolution. So there's more to it, and, and I'm giving you synonyms there uh, in case there's a question in the exam and, and it uses mediate instead of uh, arbitrate, then you have these alternative synonyms. They make decisions about challenges to arbitrate. Where we do have arbitrators and, and their decision is a challenge or where the identity of an arbitrator is challenged by one of the parties to the dispute, then the International Court will make a decision as to the um, appropriateness or the applicability of having that individual serve as an arbitrator in that particular dispute. They approve arbitration awards and they fix arbitration fees. They do other things as well, and they're not mentioned here, and I shall write them in. They monitor and I shall talk to, the, to what I'm writing, so there's no need to start complaining about my handwriting. It's very difficult writing on glass with a pen that doesn't have ink in it. So they monitor arbitration, the arbitration process. To ensure that it is performed properly and with appropriate, you see what I mean about my handwriting, and with appropriate speed and efficiency.
They do have um, official languages. They, their official languages are English and French. But you can have you know, hearing, your dispute heard. Although English and French are the official languages, they are also able to administer in any of major languages, including Arabic and Chinese and German, Portuguese, Italian, uh, Spanish, Russian. All of these languages are available for use in any arbitration hearing. Let's move on. UNCITRAL arbitration, obviously the United Nations Convention on International Trade Law, involves the settlement of a disputed contract by an independent third party, the arbitrator or the arbiter, two different words for the same person, and they often involve compromise. Because if we have a dispute, the only reason really that disputes arise is because we have two parties who don't see eye to eye. They are in conflict. One says one thing and another says, no, no that's not what I meant. I meant something completely different. So we have a dispute. Now, Unless it's clear that one party is obviously in the right and the other party is obviously in the wrong, and that's unlikely, because if you have that situation, the one clearly in the wrong is more than likely going to hold their hands up and say, no, all right, I'm sorry. So where we have two disputing parties, both of whom believe that they are in the right, then we're inevitably going to have compromise. And this is what one of the things the arbitrator will do. He will arrange a negotiated compromise, a negotiated settlement. He'll listen to both sides of the dispute and, and he'll say, well, yeah, okay, maybe I'm, I'm erring towards you, but I can see the other person's side as well. So maybe a 60-40, 70-30 split. Um, you, I don't believe that you're entirely right and I don't believe that you're entirely wrong. So let's have this negotiation. So it often involves compromise. Two parties may or may not be legally represented. Obviously, if you're going to get legal representation, then you pay the costs of legal representation, and they just don't come cheap. The decision of the arbitrator is binding, although there is normally a right of appeal to the courts. So, you may or may not like the decision of the arbitrator. If you decide you don't like it, then you've got two options, you have three, three possibilities. First of all, you can accept it reluctantly. Secondly, you can challenge the arbitrator. You can challenge the arbitrator's identity. You can challenge the decision of the arbitrator on the basis that that decision, for instance, is against the law of the contracting state of one of the disputing parties. So you can challenge the decision and you can challenge the identity of the arbitrator themselves. So we have a number of different possibilities, but otherwise normally the arbitrator's decision is binding. Advantages, well, there are costs, but because it's more informal, because we don't have to go through the formalities, we don't have to have clerks of the court and legal representation, but the cost, the cost is so much less expensive to go through the process of arbitration than it is to go through the legal procedure through courts. Speed generally is much quicker than taking a dispute to court. Courts, certainly in the UK, uh, the courts are getting quite overwhelmed with cases and you can, you can take a, a legal action and um, indicate to another party that you're taking them to court and it can be months and months, it could even be years before you get that, that process into the court system. Whereas with the arbitration, it's so much more flexible and, and generally, therefore, you can get a much quicker decision. And there is an advantage in that, not just the fact that it's quicker, but it takes away all the mental anguish, the, the sword of Damocles hanging over your head. Are you, are you going to get a decision Is it eventually? And speaking from personal experience, it's meant language not just for you, but also for your significant other. Because your significant other and your family and your friends are all worried and concerned and it builds up pressure. Whereas if we can get it over with quickly through arbitration, then we can avoid that. Privacy, court proceedings are a matter of public record. All these court cases that, um, I mentioned, particularly in the English uh, variant, 
all these court cases are from public records, and, and court cases are public, are a matter of public record. Arbitration is private, and so uh, it's unpublished, unpublicised, and you have that advantage of privacy. Informality, I've just mentioned the fact it's informal, a lot less stressful, therefore. You don't have the, um, oh, the hassle and the, oh, everyone, please stand because the judge happens to walk in. And, and if it's a jury case, you've got all the hassle of interviewing potential jurors and they've got to have time off work. And it's, a, it's, it's so formal, it can be quite stressful. Whereas informality is one of the advantages of arbitration. Expertise. The arbitrator clearly should be an acknowledged expert in the field. Incidentally, it doesn't have to be. He, she doesn't have to be an acknowledged expert, but we'll come to that in a moment. But normally, you would expect an acknowledged expert in the field where the dispute has arisen. A judge, on the other hand, is not necessarily acquainted with that area of dispute, a judge is acquainted with law and not necessarily, therefore, something as simple, for instance, as accountancy. And simple as accountancy. Did I say simple as accountancy? Decisions, because the arbitration uh, is not bound by precedent, then we have the advantage that the arbitrator is not bound to follow precedent from similar cases heard earlier on. In fact, he may be involved, let's say he's involved in two arbitration disputes in one day, and they're quite similar, but he can find in favour of one party in the first case and, and in favour of the second, because there's no precedent, there's no concept of judicial precedent. So there's a possibility, therefore, can I say flexibility? And yeah, I'm happy to say flexibility. The flexibility is an advantage because we're an innovation. We have innovation. The, where the arbitrator can come up with some totally innovative ideas where judges are bound by this concept of precedent. The, I'm going to give you another couple of advantages as well. You can choose your judge, and I use the word judge lightly in terms of, I've just said earlier that it's not a court and there aren't judges. It's, you can choose your referee. You are an integral element in the choice of the person who shall be the arbitrator. You can't do that in a court. You've got to go and look at a judge or hear that the other party in a court case has suggested that we have Judge Judge Smith and, and you don't like Judge Smith. That, that doesn't happen in the legal environment, but in the arbitration environment, you are an integral element, you are a, an active participant in the choice of your arbitrator. And another advantage as well is that you can, remember we're talking about international disputes, you can choose your language. Choose the language that they're hearing in the dispute is going to be heard in. Because if you are not fluent in, in Spanish, and the other person is, then it's going to be difficult for you fairly and sensibly and understandably to put your point forward. So why not choose a language which is neutral to both of you? If, if, you're, um, if you're German and, and the other part is a Spaniard, why not choose English or French as the language to be used during the arbitration proceedings? The requirement of qualifications for an arbitrator should be established within the arbitration agreement. They will come to the arbitration agreement in greater detail in just a moment or two. But the requirement of qualifications, not the requirement for an arbitrator, the requirement for qualifications of the arbitrator. Uh, in the event of a dispute, the arbitrator shall be uh, have 20 years' experience in the field of the international trade in copper. Um, and so we're limiting and narrowing down the field of the uh, available arbitrators. But if there is no uh, specification as to the qualifications for any proposed arbitrator, then anyone may be selected. Now, I don't wish to appear to be insulting to neither you nor your family, but if it says anyone may be selected, you may select your or may propose your grandmother. 
should be silly to resolve arbitrator. And if the other person doesn't object, then so be it. Your grandmother is there. A lot of sane and sensible and, and intelligent and perceptive thoughts come out of grandmother's mouths. So it's not being rude to your grandmother, but anyone may be selected is literally that. No one is prevented from serving as arbitrator on the grounds of nationality alone, but the arbitrator should be independent and should be unbiased. Well, that's fine. And if an arbitrator discovers that their independence is now jeopardized, then they should announce that fact and, and step aside. I'm just thinking, what if? What if they're not independent initially? Um, what if their independence becomes jeopardized, becomes threatened? If the arbitrator doesn't announce this fight, how do you find out? That's an interesting thought, isn't it? You have to rely on the fact that arbitrators, don't forget that the International Court of Arbitration does keep a record, but you don't have to follow that list that they keep. So you have to assume that the unbiased and independent arbitrator will announce the fact that they have become biased and have become lacking in independence. Any nominated arbitrator should disclose any relevant facts which may seem to impair, that's fair enough. And similarly, if it becomes the case that independence is threatened, uh, then the arbitrator should disclose the circumstances and probably step aside. And if they don't choose to step aside, then that's their choice. I Listen, it has become the case that I am no longer independent, therefore I am resigning this position. If they don't, then we have two other alternatives, two other options. Firstly, both parties may agree that the arbitration, the arbitrator's position, the identity of the arbitrator should be finished and, and they should be removed. Or either party can challenge the arbitrator concerning independence. And it's then up to the arbitrator to say, well, you're absolutely right. I am no longer independent. And so, yes, OK, I will step aside. For a dispute to go to arbitration, and I mentioned that we come back to the arbitration agreement. For a dispute to go to arbitration, under the law on international commercial arbitration, the agreement to turn must be in writing doesn't say it has to be in writing on any particular material, so it could be written on the side of a cow, or it could be written on a piece of wood, or it could be... Normally, of course, it would be written within the contract uh, that the two have entered into, and there will be a, an arbitration clause that says, in the event of dispute, the two parties submit themselves to arbitration under the model law of arbitration, model law of arbitration. and subject submit themselves. We will refer to the International Court on Arbitration in order to have nominations for the position of arbitrator. So there should be an arbitration clause, ideally. There should, I, I could put that in, couldn't I? There should ideally, therefore, be an arbitration clause within the agreement. To qualify as being in writing, I've already mentioned it, normally it will be on paper, so... So there we have the possibilities, removing the extreme possibilities of cows and pieces of wood. Uh, a document, an exchange of documents, exchange of documents referring to an agreement, or another written contract referencing to the first. The arbitration tribunal. Interesting word is tribunal. I don't think it'll come up in F4, but it's an interesting word because your instant thought, possibly, your instant thought is try as a prefix, and try normally means three, so a tribunal is typically you're going to say a person, a, a, a body of people, three people in total, therefore tribunal. No, it's got nothing to do with three, which is my initial reaction. My that there was it's, it's three people on a on a panel. No, it comes the actual root of the word is from tribe, and it's the leader of a tribe, literally a tribunal and a tribune in, in ancient Rome. A tribunal was a leader. Um, so a tribunal um, is not necessarily, you'll see in a minute, it's not necessarily a panel of three people. If they have agreed to have a sole arbitrator, the two parties need to agree on that person's identity, which makes it very difficult because if you're in dispute with me and you propose something, I'm going to, I'm going to say no, well, as a matter of course. And, and instead I will propose my own nominee and you'll say no, as a matter of, matter of principle. And so we come backwards and forwards. So it would be, I think, a silly thing to agree on having a sole arbitrator. It doesn't make sense to me. If we can't agree, then we'll need to refer the matter to the International Court. 
and let them decide on the identity of the arbitrator. If we've not agreed on a sole arbitrator, the model law states that there shall be three. If we can't agree on one, then the model law says three. So you will select your nominee and I will select my nominee. And those two nominees will then select the third person, the independent third person. And that's how that works. Uh, it's, it's quite a sensible solution, isn't it, if you think about it. Now remember I went through the advantages earlier, the cost, speed, flexibility. Of course there are two sides to everything, aren't there? Well, unless it's a Rubik's cube, in which case there are six sides. But there are two sides, advantages and disadvantages. And one or two of these disadvantages are a little bit strange, because you remember one of the advantages was privacy. Well, that's also a disadvantage. It's a disadvantage because one party may actually actively want the publicity. I was involved in a court case and, and I actively, recently, I actively wanted the publicity because I knew I was right. And the other party, a, a major accountancy firm, uh, knew they were wrong, but they still resisted and it, it nearly got to court until they eventually capitulated and, and paid me what I was due. Um, but that had cost me a lot of money to get that settlement in legal fees and translator's fees and court costs that I had to put into court, I got those back. Uh, so one party may actually want the, the publicity. The application of the law. Independent arbitrators don't, don't know the law necessarily. They might know the business, they might know the, the matter in dispute, but if they don't know the law, they could potentially come up with all sorts of decisions which don't necessarily get close to being legally satisfactory. Whereas courts, judges are experts in, in the law. Predictability is a disadvantage. Arbitrators are not bad. Predictability is often a good thing. That's why judicial precedent is seen as a good thing. But arbitrators are not bound by precedent and therefore dispute resolutions are non-predictable. They're open to whim of the, I don't know if you know the word, they're open to the whim of the arbitrator. The, the mental feeling of the arbitrator at the time of the dispute. And judges are bound to follow, so certainty is, is an advantage normally, whereas certainty can be a disadvantage or an advantage, depends on, on whether you want that certainty. Precedent resolution under uh, arbitration creates no precedent, and that's a, a disadvantage because I mentioned earlier the possibility of an arbitrator on, on two disputes on the same day. And it can come up with one decision and three hours later come up with a completely different decision, even though the facts may be similar. So that could be disadvantageous. So uh, it's two sides to, to each argument, really. Application of argument, uh, arbitrations, awards set aside or cancelled. These are, in my view, these are relatively, um, what's the word, understandable, um, rational. You can, you can see the common sense in these. Incapacity, where, where I'm on the way to the arbitration hearing, where I'm knocked over and find myself in hospital, in a coma for, for five months, then if I'm under an incapacity when the hearing took place, because I don't turn up, the hearing could go ahead and the decision made, and there I am lying in hospital in a coma. So I can challenge that decision. When I come out of the coma, if ever, uh, then I can challenge that decision. Notice where I get insufficient notice of, of either the appointment of the arbitrator or of the date of the hearing. And the invalidity of the agreement. If the decision from the tribunal is illegal, in, it's invalid under the law governing the contract. And if that's the case, no matter how sensible it may be, if it's against the local law where the contract was decided to be um, created, where we're in international states and we agree that the, any dispute will be resolved by Nepalese law, uh, then when a decision is made, if it's in contradiction to Nepalese law, then clearly we would challenge that decision. Public policy is claimed to be against the public policy of the claimant's state. Again, common sense. Subject matter, the tribunal is restricted and the, and the arbitrator is restricted in their decisions 
uh, um, to make their decisions only on those matters that are the subject of the dispute and, and not err outside or beyond the bounds of that disputed matter, even though it may be sensible and obvious that one party is clearly in the wrong about some of the matter, the arbitrator cannot rule on that extraneous matter. And the composition of the proper requirements have not been followed. If we've not got the three arbitrators and we should have, then again we can challenge the arbitrator and or the arbitration decision. And we move finally to the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law. This was set up in 1926 in, and it resides now in a place in Rome. It's, it's um, an interdependent intergovernmental institution based in Rome. And they studied the need for how to modernize, harmonize, um, standardize, coordinate private law in all these different states that are signed up to the International Institute. And there are 63, uh, at the time of recording, that 63 states have signed in to the UNIDRAT uh, Institute. It's a particular concern is international trade law. So we're into the UNCITRAL area again. And it has a three tier structure. Uh, the Secretariat, the, which is the executive audio, organ. They are responsible for the day to day. They are the ones that. Uh, that are the, the cogwheels, the driving force of the, uh, of the International Institute. They drive it forward, they, they dictate what comes next. It's headed by the Secretary General, I'll, I'll put that in. It's headed by the Secretary General, and the Secretary General themselves, I hesitate to say himself, herself, they're appointed by the Governing Council. The Secretary General is appointed by this next body, this Governing Council. The Governing Council itself is made up of 25 members, typically judges, but then it sort of goes downhill from there, in my humble view. It goes downhill from then on. It, it, 25 members, judges or practitioners or academics or civil servants. So the 25 members starts really high powered with judges and then disappears down into the civil service. And they supervise policy, they drop the work program, they supervise how the secretary. If you like, they're the handlebars of this cogwheel of the bicycle that is the secretary, the secretariat. The governing council directs the direction that the secretariat is to take. So they supervise policy, they draw the work program, and they supervise how the secretariat carry out the program. Then we get the General Assembly. And if the if the secretariat is the, the cogwheel and the um, governing council is the handlebars, then the General Assembly are the pedals. They are the ones that give power to the handlebars and the cogwheel. They are the ones that that ultimately drive it forward. It's all right having handlebars, it's all right having a cogwheel, but unless you can turn that cogwheel with your pedals, you get nowhere. And so the General Assembly, they're the ultimate decision-making body, and they approve the budget every year. They approve the work program every three years, and they elect the General Council, do you want to guess? Do you want to guess? every five years. One member in the General Assembly, one member from each of the states that have signed in. The, 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 I'm going to call them member states. But they're not really the, the states that have signed in to this international institute and, and helped to finance this inst international institute. Someone's got to pay for all this to happen. And so the General Assembly is, comprises 63 members at the time of recording, 63 members from one member from each of the member states. And this is the way that they do. They elect the General Council, the General Council supervises the Secretariat, or well, the Secretariat is the, is the main one. Without the, without the cog, doesn't matter how hard you pedal, you're not going to move. 
And so that's the the uh, International Institute, Institute for the Unification of Private Law. And that's chapter four.